thank you everyone for coming in on a Sunday. Thank you. This is this is going to be an interesting session. Um, maybe I'd love to start with Kabir, perhaps, because um, Kabir, you, Afghanistan is is there is such a big story where, where Afghanistan is concerned, where you where, where you're concerned. I mean, it, your your first feature um, was Kabul Express, which was um, a nice sort of satirical take on on the situation and the relationships, but. But you've made documentaries on Afghanistan before. Do um, you want to set context and explain? I, I, you've said in the past that Afghani that, that, that music and, 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 and film saved your life in Afghanistan. Um, maybe this is a story we'd love to hear. Yeah, that is, uh, yeah, probably that's a good starting point. It's a story that uh, most audience in India know because I've repeated it ad nauseum. And if my wife Minnie is here, she'll be rolling her eyes. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, she's there. Uh, but I think uh, it's an interesting uh, starting point to uh, literally why I moved towards Vol. I used to be a documentary filmmaker. Um, and um, post 9-11, actually first time uh, I'd gone to Afghanistan was in 1996, just literally a couple of months before the Taliban took over Kabul. And I was doing a, a documentary there for the International Committee of the Red Cross, but it became too... Uh, dangerous to be there and so we had to sort of leave and I said okay I'll come back in some time but then it was five years of Taliban rule so there was no way I could go back and the moment 9-11 happened um, you know I just said okay I think it's time we should go back now and you know uh, maybe try and do a documentary there and so me and a friend of mine Rajan Kapoor who's who's always been my sort of executive producer of all my films uh, we decided to go to Afghanistan and um, uh, there were not too many idiots trying to jump into Afghanistan at that point in time. So producers were ready to, you know, give us the budget and uh, they let us off. But we couldn't go via the usual uh, route that everybody else was going, which is via Pakistan, uh, via Peshawar, because, you know, on Indian passport, especially uh, journalists, stroke documentary makers, you wouldn't get a visa. So we had to overfly. We went to Uzbekistan and we drove to Tajikistan. And from the city of Dushanbe, we were trying to enter Afghanistan. And Every attempt, uh, something would fail. You know, we would we tried to drive across, and there were these landslides in the mountains. We couldn't cross over. Uh, there was a helicopter that we were supposed to take that crashed the day before we were supposed to board that. So it was like a dead end for 14 days. We kept trying to go in, and uh, one day Rajan and I woke up and said, "Okay, I think it's time to go back home. It's probably we're not destined to reach Afghanistan." And we said, okay, we'll make one last attempt. And that day, we went to the air base, and there was a Russian military helicopter loading up medical supplies to, to be taken to Kabul. And we saw that as our last chance. We took the, the Russian pilot uh, a bit to the side and did our Indian routine. Well, basically, <laughs> we bribed him with uh, a few thousand dollars. And uh, he said, okay, he you know, hit us uh, amongst the cargo and uh, took off. And we were on the way to Kabul, and it was literally just to like a 40-minute um, uh, helicopter uh, ride through the Hindu Kush mountains. And um, he suddenly brought the helicopter down, and uh, it was hovering about 20 feet above the ground. And he said, jump. I said, what the hell? We've given you $2,000. Take us to Kabul. He says, I can't take you to the air base because you're, you're contraband. You're not uh, military personnel. And uh, so I said, OK, at least land the chopper so that we can get off. He said, I can't do that because some technical jargon about it takes time to reboot the chopper and then, you know, he'll be off the radar. Uh, and so literally, we have, which is the way it was in my first feature film, uh, the two actors, and I promise you we jumped from higher. The, uh, the, the, the actors were chicken to jump from that height. We jumped off and this helicopter takes off and we're in the middle of nowhere. It's just snow all over, 360 degrees, there's snow-clad mountains. And then we see this one person, this one very angry-looking Mujahideen of the Northern Alliance coming, walking towards us. And I promise you, I thought, that is it. That's the way my life's been written. I'm going to be shot over here. Nobody would know where I am because nobody knew I'm in that helicopter to Kabul. And uh, he was saying something in Dari. We couldn't understand. The only thing I knew was that there was a lot of warmth uh, towards Indians uh, amongst the Afghans, especially the Northern Alliance. Um, and we kept saying, Hindustan, Hindustan, India. And this man suddenly stopped. 
So when he understood what you're saying, and he smiled and started singing a song, Mere Sapno Ki Rani Kab Aye Oh my God. And that day, I realized the power of Bollywood and music. And I said, Truly. if I get alive out of this, I'm going to make a film. <laughs> and, I, and I also heard that you had to have kebabs for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Is that true? You know, there was nothing open in Kabul in those days because, uh, as I had said earlier, in those days in Kabul, if you were from outside Afghanistan, you were either journalists or spies. Uh, there was nobody else. And there was this one um, hotel, Herat, which was open in, uh, in, in Kabul. And uh, that's the only place where there was curfew by 6 p.m. So you had to run, grab your kebabs, uh, and then in the morning reach, grab your kebabs, uh, and that's it. But yeah, those are exciting times. And actually, it's all, it's all these adventures um, that I spent about a month there making my documentary. And it's all these um, encounters which basically led to the script of my first feature film, Kabul Express. So Afghanistan has a huge role to play in me becoming a, a, a filmmaker and the people of Afghanistan. Because when the death threats came when we were filming and the Taliban wanted us to stop filming and... Uh, uh, it was quite a traumatic time. Uh, it, literally, it's the people of Afghanistan who stood by us and uh, allowed us to continue um, filming. You know, that's an interesting story, and it's 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 interesting how sort of you know you had moments that could lend themselves to sort of comedy in a in a, in a film. Arana, your own um, experiences in in Afghanistan, of course don't necessarily lend themselves to humor. Uh, can you talk about your memories and your experiences and how those have perhaps impacted and informed your music? Absolutely. I, um, I left Afghanistan at the age of eight. I was really little. Uh, but then um, when I was older and I became a singer, uh, probably at the age of 23, 24, um, I went back to Afghanistan because the love and the, the connection that I have with my land, with my motherland, with my people and everything. Um, I decided to go back in 2011 uh, for, for a major concert for one of the biggest TV stations that we have in Afghanistan called Tolo TV. And started my music career and during this time we were still at war with Taliban and everything and they were trying everything they could do to stop us from pursuing um, music inside Afghanistan. But artists like me for, for many, many years still, we have been trying to use music as a tool um, uh, to basically fight darkness, yeah. uh, use it as resistance against the, the dark rule of Taliban. And it still continues like that. And I have many, many, you know, beautiful experiences in Afghanistan. But at the same time, dark experiences. Uh, I've been under threats, like direct threats from Taliban and from the mullahs. Uh, they actually even announced for my head to be cut off and at one or two points. So that it has been like an ongoing battle inside Afghanistan. But I have to tell you, music has been a very huge part of our culture and history and heritage in Afghanistan um, for thousands of years. Um, I'm pretty sure you know about like some of the biggest and most, most well-known uh, poets, for example, um, Rumi or Maulana Jalaluddin Balkhi, and, and Balkh, uh, by the way, is, is in Afghanistan. They were indeed born inside Afghanistan and they, they, their poetry was in Farsi. And even if we go back to the history in India, for example, um, the, 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 some of the, the singers who would sing at the darbars of the kings, they would sing in our language in Farsi. Uh, or as you would know, um, they would use the darbari dialect, which is a dialect of Farsi language. So. To summarize this, the thing is Afghans are very, very, very related to music. It's in their veins, it's in their culture, it's in our history. And no matter what they do, they I don't think they can vanish it. I don't think they can stop it. People still listen to music in Afghanistan right now, in their cars, in their homes, and there's nothing they can control that. So it's basically an ongoing um, fight or battle between the dark and the, the light. And um, I am also a part of that. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, it's a question I asked the actors earlier in the day. We had a panel with actors, and I asked them if, if, if great art can come from a place of conflict. And in their case, of course, it was about whether you know whether you're on an uncomfortable set working with a director who's temperamental. But but to the two of you, it's it's conflict literally. You know, uh, uh, clearly clearly th that is true. I mean, is that, is that fair to to ask you and to assume that that is true then? That great, and you, you I suppose you're living proof of that. Um, yeah, I mean, to some extent, yes, that statement is true because what happens is I think in conflict zones, and this is something as a documentary filmmaker, I, use, I have found myself in a lot of conflict zones. Of course, Afghanistan is a place that I spent a lot of time in. But even back uh, in India, uh, Kashmir is somewhere where I've worked a lot. I was, uh, because I used to do uh, basically political documentaries and worked a lot with uh, journalist Said Nakwi, you know, we went to Bosnia and we were in Palestine for a long time. I think what happens in, in conflict zones is that People are tested, right? That they 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 pushed to circumstances where they when they rise to the occasion, uh, there's there's something about them that makes great storytelling for us, for somebody like me who's always looking at stories, right? Because these are really um, uh, trying circumstances. Circumstances like if you hear Ariana's story, I was just we were having breakfast together and I was hearing the story. These are not circumstances where an average regular person would ever go through they wouldn't yeah. even their wildest you know nightmares uh, and in that uh, there's something that the way a person will react or the way the person will will have to come up uh, and rise to the occasion is what uh, can make great stories uh, uh, thing I think you know just Ariana's story itself is such a it's a movie waiting to be made I guess <laughs> as a form of sort of resistance and resilience because it, 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 it points to both in your case to some extent. Absolutely. As I mentioned earlier, artists like myself, we have been using uh, music as a tool for resistance against the brutal rule of Taliban for many, many years. For myself, uh, let's say if I do one entertaining or happy song, my next song would always be... Um, for the empowerment of women, or to speak for women, for example. And uh, so, and music does have the power. I know that these songs that I do, I know that these messages that I bring out to people, they have a very positive impact on the society and on the minds of people. Uh, it does actually affect them in a, in a positive manner. And I guess in the long, long term, we will wait to see great results also. Kabir, from, from making documentaries about Afghanistan, about your experiences there, to making a feature film which uh, which which sort of had, I don't want to say all the tropes because it wasn't, it wasn't, I, I, it was actually very pure uh, in that the the uh, the experience was was never compromised, even though it was told uh, with, with some of the tropes of filmmaking. Um, you know, can you talk about directing your first feature and going from sort of the documentary approach and the document the grammar of a documentary film to to telling it in a um, you know in a in a fiction format and and how you sort of uh, adapted to that being someone who had worked in the non fiction space for so long before that so you know when I, when i was trying to make the transition rajiv a lot of people would actually say i do not jump straight from documentaries to um, features don't you want to sort of try your hand at uh, doing fiction maybe for television format i was like i don't know i i for me it was so i am a trained filmmaker because i went i did my masters in filmmaking and it, though my film school uh, which is jamia mcrc jamia is more oriented at, especially at that point in time towards documentary filmmaking um political uh, yeah. documentary filmmaking really and uh, but at somewhere down the line i always thought Ultimately, it's about telling a story, whether you're saying it in a documentary format or in a fictional format. It's a story that you're narrating, and um, I feel if you have the ability to narrate a story and captivate your audience, you could probably do it in any format that's available uh, to you. Um, having said that, my first uh, film itself was uh, based on my documentary experience yeah. totally. Almost ev like this scene that I just narrated, uh -huh actually on paper was the way I, I narrated to you. And then I made some of my friends read it and they said, this is an absolutely ridiculous scene. And I said, why? I said, How do you expect this six feet, four inch Mujahideen to be singing Mere Sapno Ki Rani? I said, but he did. It happened, yeah. He said, yeah, but nobody's going to believe it. Correct. But I said, it did happen to me. Why will they not believe it? And so, 
and I, that was my first film. Today, when I look back, I would I should not have changed it. <laughs> but in my script, I changed it. So he's not singing songs. He starts saying, "Ah, Amitabh Bachchan, yeah. and Devendra, and all that." Um, so, so I was in my first attempt to go from documentaries to fiction. I think emboldened by the fact that all of this is true. Right. So, how can it like ring not, hollow or not, not not connect? So, almost every you know, even that Buskashi scene, which people yeah. found uh, like oh, did this really happen? Little where, where basically. Uh, so when I landed there, the Taliban uh, had actually banned Buskashi. Buskashi is the sport which the the Northern Territories play more, and ironically, Taliban had said it's too violent a game, uh, so they had <laughs> so, so they had they had banned it. Uh, and but I think the political reason was that because it it was more identified with the Northern Alliance and less with the um, with Southern Afghanistan, that they didn't do it. So when I landed in 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 Kabul, in like. This was, I think, November 2001, when the Americans were still bombing those areas. They had this big celebratory game of Buskashi, and the whole of Kabul had come to see it. So not only were these 25 horses galloping with them, there were 1,000 men galloping, like running alongside, and it was chaos. And I told my, my friend to, because I was shooting the camera, and I said, you know, from the viewfinder, it's very difficult sometimes to judge distance. So if they're dangerously close, just pull me away. Mm -hmm. And so I'm taking this shot, secure in the thought that Rajan will you know, literally look after my back. And I'm, these horses are coming, galloping full sprint towards me. And I'm zooming out, zooming out, zooming out, zooming out, waiting for that time when Rajan will say, OK, move. I've reached the end of my zoom. The horses are still coming towards me. And I just move my camera, and they're literally here. Oh wow. And I just managed to dive out of the, that path. And I look back, and I see Rajan like he was hit by the horse. And he was like somersaulting Aww. in the air. And fortunately, he wasn't very seriously injured. But I said, what the hell were you doing? <laughs> and he said, no, you know, there was this one horse there at the back. And I kept worrying that that will come towards us. <laughs> 22 horses are galloping towards you. Now, these are the kind of scenes that actually happened with me and I put in the script. Um, and I guess uh, if I had writ written them just as uh, a part of my imagination as fiction, Correct. I would have kept doubting myself. Yeah, you've never and been said, convinced no, yourself. No, yeah. no. Yeah. I said, this happened with me. Yeah. So let me just put it exactly the way. Uh, so you can't make up this stuff. You can't right? make up this stuff. So, so I think that's how it started. And then I got a good uh, response uh, to um, the film. Yeah. Uh, and that, in a certain sense, emboldened me. And then Aditya Chopra, you know, he said, there's something about the way you bring politics into your film where I'm, it's, I'm allowed to access the politics as and when I need it. Right. Uh, and in mainstream cinema at that point in time, it was, no it was taboo. It. Yeah. Uh, and my next film, which is uh, yeah. New York, was also a very political film. Yeah. Again, set in a very mainstream format. Uh, first time with some songs being thrown in. Yeah. But uh, was even more political than uh, Kabul Express. So I think that it just then, from there, I gradually just started evolving my own style. Right, right. Ariana, y you know, you, I don't know if, if fortunate is the right word. You were fortunate to, to, to flee Afghanistan, you know, when, when, when you could, um, what what is the current state of musicians and artists in Afghanistan? Is that something you can talk about? Absolutely. Unfortunately, for the second time around, Taliban have completely banned music from in Afghanistan. And um, although artists like myself, we still continue to produce music from outside, yeah. but the main production of Afghan music actually came from inside Afghanistan. And now this ban has had a major impact, negative impact on the production and progress of, of our music, unfortunately. And I know also that uh, hundreds of artists and musicians, they are stuck inside Afghanistan still and they are struggling. Beside the women and, and girls of Afghanistan that have been struggling the most, I think artists also have been the most unfortunate in this case. And um, they did not just take their skills, their passion and their love away from music, but they also took away the only source of income that they had, right? Their income come, came from music. And now with the, the music being banned, I know of so many singers that they don't even have food on their table to feed their children and their, their kids actually go to bed hungry at nights with no food. 
And it's just so heartbreaking and, and, and so hard to see all of this happening. I do try to help uh, artists and singers uh, within my own capacity and, and whatever that I can do, but that's not enough. There's a lot of them. If there's hundreds of singers stuck there, there's thousands of their family members also who are suffering really badly uh, as of right now that we, we're talking. And um, it's just very heartbreaking. Afghanistan's music and, 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 and artists are not doing well at all. They're basically living a life of prisoners. You know, I'd imagine it's, it's, the stakes are much higher than, than in, even in a place like Iran where you, where you hear of stories of filmmakers who've been home imprisoned and they're, and they're still able to, to make home films or uh, you know, shoot locally and, and, and put it out. That is not something that, that obviously is an option. It's not an option, actually. Um, they're too scared to yeah, pursue course. anything, even in their own homes, because they're constantly being checked. Uh, if uh, Taliban check their houses and they see instruments, they not only break the instruments, they actually punish them, uh, they uh, beat them up, um, or they take them to prison, um, and do the, the, the worst things that pos that's possible. So they're too scared, they're too afraid to, to pursue anything. So like, even that, like traditional instruments of music, like the sarod. Sarod actually comes from Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, even that, they would. Uh Anything that's named a musical instrument is banned. And the the weirdest part is Taliban actually sing. They have songs, but it's just singing without any musical instruments, without music. So according to them, I mean, they they can sing, but no music should be there in the background. I don't know what kind of belief that is. It's quite funny, but that's what's happening there. So music as entertainment is completely... Completely banned. No more music in and Afghanistan. And, and did, they, did they target uh, musicians? Like the well-known, like, of course, you were very, very prominent, but not as famous as you, but did they uh, try and target the musicians who were uh, left behind in Kabul once they took over? And did they sort of take any action against them or just basically I stop them? I would say just, just stop them. Like, and in general, all... All the artists, I would say, would be targets. Of course, they would be, you know, stopped from pursuing music. Of course, I, I, I have been the biggest target of Taliban, like direct target of them, because of the fact that I am a woman and I'm a female, and I've been going to Afghanistan pursuing music, being a judge on on talent shows without a scarf and everything. My case was completely different, but for the rest of the singers, they just wanted them to completely stop music and. Uh, don't pursue it anymore. And as long as they didn't do anything, they would just leave them alone. But again, as I said, they are scared to to go outside. Some of them, you know, they don't have a source of income and they're just prisoners and they're living a very hard life right now. Because when I was in Afghanistan, obviously in the years when the Taliban was not there, you would hear music everywhere. I know. Like we would go to the bazaars and there would be music and, and a lot of it of course would be uh, Bollywood music yeah. because they're really fond of uh, Bollywood music also and uh, so it's really sad that that, has, that means completely come uh, to and I remember uh, when I had gone back the, the, f the same trip uh, we went in uh, the cinemas had obviously been shut down for five years right. And there was the biggest uh, cinema hall, uh, I forget the name now. Uh, the projectionist, when the uh, Taliban had come, he took the projection back home and hid it. Wow. So in 2001, then it was opening up, he brought it back. Mm -hmm. And he had managed to carry six reels of oh, one film that uh, was lying with him. And he just cleaned, they cleaned up the theater and he put this projection back on. And they were playing six reels of a film. And they were not even six continuous reels. I think there was reel one, three, five. Seven. But they put them all together and it was running to full houses. Just the pleasure of watching a film again. Exactly. I mean, this tells you how much Afghans love music. As I said, music has been a part of our culture for thousands of years. And, you know, they love Bollywood movies. They love the music and everything. And almost in, like, in so many households, you would actually find uh, families that have, uh, for example, tabla and har on a normal, you know, uh, basis. They would have a tabla and harmonium in their houses. And they would have at least one person uh, who would sing just 
as fun for to entertain the, the family, you know, in private parties or, or gatherings and everything. So this is how much, you know, it's it's music is loved by our people, but unfortunately, um, you know, they've been forced into 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 you know not listening to music or, or not pursuing it and everything by Taliban, which is extremely sad. Kabir, when you were making the, f the, the, the short for the My Bel Melbourne uh, f film, the anthology, uh, you made Sitara, which is, uh, which is the story of this uh, Afghani girl. Um, why was this a story that you wanted to tell? Um, is there still that sort of residue um, in terms of stories that you, fr fr you know, about, about the Afghan people, about your observations, um, about the state of, uh, you know? Yeah, I mean, I do. If you, if you, I mean, if you're asking, there, there is a, a special place that Afghanistan has uh, in my heart. And um, so there is always something. Because also, you see, the thing is, your first film is always very special, yeah. right? And so the fact that my first film was set in Afghanistan, the fact that the people of Afghanistan really helped us complete my film. I, I remember uh, it was a, there was a time when I thought it might not happen. We were literally 12 days into filming when the uh, Indian ambassador called us and said, we've got these death threats uh, that the uh, Indian intelligence has picked up and so have the Americans and there are five people who have been sent to Kabul to hit out at uh, your actors, John Abraham and Arshad and, and you and there was this whole um, death threat that had come and uh, at one point I thought it, it's, it's not going to happen and we had to fly out our actors and then Aditya Chopra, you know, the only time he ever spoke to me on set, in, I did three films with him and that was, he called me up and he said, you know, None of us know Afghanistan better than you do. We, we're doing this film because, uh, you know, yeah. uh, you know the people and, uh, and that's true. It's, a, it's my friends and my, my people I'd sort of uh, gotten to know during my documentaries who helped me. Uh, Siddiq Barmak, uh, the very celebrated uh, Afghan filmmaker of, you know, his film was nominated at the Oscar, um, Osama. He is a dear friend. He helped me set up this whole uh, film. And they rallied around us. And uh, the kind of security that they was brought on and made sure that I, I complete my film. So yeah, so Afghanistan always does have a very sort of a special place in my heart. And uh, and but it, it really happened because uh, it was three years ago that I was here with my uh, previous film, which uh, also Mituji Mituji gave me best. Uh, um, film award for. By the way, you know, I think we should make it a tradition. Every time I make a film, give me an award, then I can come <laughs> to my... <laughs> We've had two years, so maybe the third year also. Uh, and at that time, I brought the legendary cricketer Kapil Dev uh, with me. And uh, we were at this one, uh, uh, like a reception um, on the opening day of the festival. And I saw this really excited bunch of girls uh, in their hijab coming to wanting to meet Kapil Dev. And I was saying, why are they so excited to meet Kapil Dev? And uh, I realized they're the Afghan cricket team. Mm -hmm. And that was Satara's elder sisters, uh, who actually started the Afghan cricket team. And little Satara was also there. And I just saw that and I said, that's the story. Yeah. At that point, we had started talking. Mitu and I had started discussing that we should do something like this. And we didn't, in fact, even discussed a couple of stories. And we were working on them. But suddenly, I saw this story walk into, you know, frame uh, with us and that's it. And then I said, okay, this is the one that I want to do. And I, it combined, uh, I guess, uh, two things uh, which I enjoyed, right? Yeah. Afghanistan and cricket. cricket yeah. Yeah. Ariana, how did you come to be involved? And do you remember getting the call to do the song and, and what that was like? Yes, I mean, I got to sing the theme song of this beautiful movie, movie or film that has been directed by none other than the amazing, talented director next to me. Please give him a big round of applause, by the way. <laughs> and also, thanks to Mituji, who actually invited me, um, you know, to be a part of this festival, uh, as I have sung the theme song, as I mentioned, and, and, and the song is uh, called Freedom. And it's about uh, the, the sweet uh, cricketer, a cricket player, the female cricket player that he just named Satara. And um, so I got to come here and, uh, you know, I, I have to say I feel so lucky, so fortunate, and I'm very honored to be a small part of his movie, of course. And uh, also oh, we have a common friend here, Hiraji, who has been our friend um, 
for seven, eight years. Uh, he has been the middleman in between us and got us connected. Thank you for that. And so this is how I got to come here. And um, last night, not last night, the, the night before, we had uh, the, the award show, which was really, really enjoyable, really nice. I had a really great time meeting all these wonderful, talented, uh, amazing directors and actors from India. And it has been an honor for me. You know, there's no way I can have an artist here and not ask you to give us a few lines from the song. <laughs> <laughs> I know this doesn't have the acoustics of a studio, but we will forgive. Absolutely, we can do this. So I basically got to sing uh, the song both in Hindi and Farsi. Okay. I will probably sing the Hindi part. I hope I don't mess up the lyrics. Jukna nahi ab doop se chalte rahe badhte rahe behroop se rukna nahi अब धूप से ओ चलते रहे भरते रहे बहरूप से मैं क्यों थकी नहीं मैं क्यों रुकी नहीं जीना भी था कहाँ लो मैं जी रही यही जाना है जाना है जाना है आगे मुझे ये आसमां तो नहीं रोके मुझे जाना है जाना है जाना है आगे मुझे ओह लवली थैंक यू The Dari version, sure. I think we should hear the Dari version also. There's something beautiful about it. <laughs> I hope I can remember the lyrics again. We won't. We won't. We won't. We won't. We won't. از راه خود با باورم تا باورم تا باورم تا که این زندگی است راه هم استادگی است تا که این زندگی است راه هم آزادگی است I love the hook line آزادی 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 آزادگی آزادی 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 آزادگی هر کی اگر مان شود این راه ما یک جای آزادی 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 آزادگی Oh. <laughs> oh my God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so That's much. so beautiful. You know, I work in the Hindi film industry, which is known for his song and dance. I promise you, it's very rare to guess, get goose fresh and somebody singing live oh my God. With, with just so like no acoustics. And thank it's, uh, oh my and, God. And, and, and you know, it's so in, it is a, actually I feel stupid telling this story, but uh, there's a saying in, uh, in Hindi, uh, uh, Diya tale andhera mm. basically means it's it, the, it's darkest under the, uh, the the you know the earthen candle that we have flame uh, and uh, because I was making this film and I said obviously it has to have a Dari song right and uh, we got this uh, uh, song and uh, we got it written here uh, in in Australia and then I said okay how do we okay who will sing this and we were not being able to find somebody who could find. So I said, okay, it doesn't matter. You know, somebody from India will sing it. The, yeah. the, the languages are, are similar. So the, 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 it's not difficult to pronounce the words. So we got it uh, very beautifully dubbed by somebody. We, we sent you the reference. Um, and there was a lot of back and forth and we're saying, okay, is it correct? And a lot of pronunciations were checked and redone and everything was fine. But I don't know what something in my heart was saying, is it correct? <laughs> because, you know, I'm very criti critical of 
the Western films that come and make films yeah. in, in South yeah. Asia and then Correct. don't really care about the little yeah. nuances yeah. and uh, say that it'll be fine. I was like, am I doing the same yeah. thing? Um, and I kept asking Me Too. I said, Me Too, are you sh You know, I think Me Too was asking, are you sure it's correct? And yeah. they said that everything is absolutely correct. <laughs> Every pronunciation is absolutely correct. But we know it's not been sung by an Afghan. Yeah. And I've really felt yeah. gutted. I said, that cannot work. And then I suddenly realized, oh my God, through uh, Mr. Hira Bulani, I have been, you know, corresponding with somebody who's close to the biggest Afghan <laughs> singer in the world. And why am I looking around? And I said, okay, <laughs> the worst will happen is that Aryan will say, no, I don't have the time to do this. I just picked up the phone and I said, Hiraji, there's this true, you know, uh, opportunity for a collaboration. Would Aryana consider doing this? And literally within a few hours, you know, they said, Aryana would love to do it. <laughs> and that's how. Of course, you know, it, it's such an honor for me, as I said, you know, to be a part of your movie. Uh, you are a legendary director and we have so much love and respect for you, for your art, for your work and everything. And how, you know, every time you make a movie about Afghanistan, about our culture, we appreciate you even more, you know, because this is so sweet. And especially because, uh, you know, Afghanistan has been a very, very rich cultured country. Uh, and has been there for centuries, but um, the world do not know a lot about the good sides of Afghanistan. The, all they know is Taliban, the bombardments, the rockets, Gulbuddin, and this and that. And you always portray the beautiful side of our country, and we appreciate that. So it's an honor for me. Thank you for reaching out. I'm so happy I got to do this with you. Thank you so much. It's an absolute privilege. That's you right. Actually, this is what my friend yesterday was saying about how most of the times when films are portraying, you know, Afghans or the Pakhtuns or Pashtuns, there's always a stereotypical portrayal. You know, they're always the, they're either the terrorists or they're these large-hearted people who will come in like, you know, to solve everything. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're never just normal people with normal insecurities and... Pathan. And, and, uh, pathan. Pathan matlab, it's like a... Um, yeah. And I've grown up with that because I'm also, you know, a, a, a Pathan. Uh, and that maybe a part of the fascination for Afghanistan actually comes from, from there because I remember uh, reading, uh, in those days there was a very famous book called Roots. It used to be that yeah. thick. Alex Huxley. Alex and I read that and I got fascinated. But I said, what about my roots? Yeah. And I would keep going back to my father. And my father uh, was an academic. He was a professor. So anything and everything he answered would not be just a small little answer. He said, oh, you're really interested? Okay, yeah. here's some <laughs> course material to study. <laughs> And, uh, and then we sort of, you know, there was a family tree that was drawn up which went back seven generations and I realized that somewhere in the distant past my, my ancestors came from, from Afghanistan. Uh, so I think that fascination was always there that one day I want to go there. Um, and which I did. Hopefully you will come back in the future also. I'm a big believer that you are going to come back to Afghanistan. I am going to go back to Afghanistan. For sure. Don't you guys think so? We're not going to give up. Freedom. <laughs> you know, before we open it out to the to the room for questions, I, just a last question to both of you: Do you believe that that music and art and film can truly sort of unite people? I very strongly believe that. So, so I wouldn't take it to the extent because I, I guess I am also at the end of the you know a filmmaker and artist. I don't know whether I would be as. Uh, I, I, arrogant to say that it can change the world or it can change. But it definitely makes you think, right? Uh, and I have experienced this uh, in my own uh, career. There's a um, film of mine, Bajrangi Bhaijan, which just got this unbelievable response across the world, but especially in the, in the subcontinent. Uh, because at a time when, you know, films are only, especially in the mainstream, the films are only about, you know, India-Pakistan's hostility and yeah. how India-Pakistan, so the action films would always have the villain from Pakistan and ISI, the whole, you know, shebang, the thing. I made a film basically which was about a, a small Pakistani uh, girl who can't speak, six-year-old, who gets lost on this side of the border and uh, an, an Indian man who was a little right-wing and very sort of narrow-minded in his uh, outlook towards other communities, towards Muslims, and, and he hates Pakistan because, not that because he's a, he's a bad man, but he's just been grown up in that. Yeah. And he discovers this girl who cannot speak, and then 
slowly the identity of the girl is discovered that not only is she Muslim, but she's also from Pakistan. And now he's in this quandary of what to do. And then it's a story of how he literally smuggles himself and the little girl into Pakistan to, to repatriate her with her family. And in the process realizes how wrong his beliefs were about people and the so-called enemy country. And that, for a brief while, really just, it just caught the fancy of the, it, it, it became one of the highest crossing films ever in Hindi film industry. And it was being called the Bajrangi Diplomacy because there were people from Pakistan who was reaching out to us and messaging and there were these news channel discussions happening on both sides of the border. And I remember this very famous uh, Pakistani uh, uh, author who did this interview and he said, you know, I don't, I don't know why, but I saw the film and I just want to go out and I wanted to hug an Indian. I, I just went out onto the streets of London and I wanted to find an Indian and hug him. So it does work. Now, did that change the dynamics between India and Pakistan? No. <laughs> <laughs> we are back to square one. But for a brief moment, it can, uh, it led to, you remember that girl who was repatriated yes, from Pakistan? Yes. There was, so because of the film, there was an the, attention on real, one, yeah, real. a real Munni who was an Indian yes. girl lost on the other side of the border. And then she was finally brought back to India because, so it can, art can make you think, yeah. art can make you introspect. Uh, but, I don't know whether it can truly change the world, but I think if there's a lot of art that keeps pushing yeah. this counterpoint towards you, then maybe we can change the world. Definitely. Um, I have actually sung um, songs in many languages in, in, in my country and different dialects. I've sung in Farsi, Pashto, Hazaragi, uh, Uzbeki. And uh, I want to say the very reason why I'm here in Australia right now is because I sang a song in Hindi and Farsi and I ended up here, and, and for example, we were at the award show the other night, the song of this movie called RRR. Everybody like yeah, knew, it, yeah. knew the song, they were dancing to it, and everybody internationally know that song and they dance to it. So it definitely unites people. You know, this is a big sign, definitely um, unites people. Uh, music is a power and uh, it's amazing. We can take a few questions. Okay, the gentleman in the front row. Yes, everyone, short so we can get more people uh, in. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, to inviting me. And, uh, you know, I'm experiencing, uh, you know, the best moment of my life. Because there is India, there is Afghanistan, and there is Pakistan. And the uh, to, uh, answer to your question, uh, what art can do is, you know, it can connect people, you know, like the musician, the filmmaker from India, the filmmaker from Pakistan. Uh, so it is, you know, this is uh, what art can make change. So this is, you know, I'm witnessing, so, you know, it's like my achievement of life that I'm experiencing this and I will tell my country, my people that, this is India, this is Afghanistan, this is Pakistan. And the most important thing I want to mention, the, the singers from uh, uh, the singers from Afghanistan who can afford or who, who can, uh, you know, uh, who flew from Afghanistan, the rest, they are left. They are, you know, by somehow from our region, like uh, uh, from our Pakhtunkhwa. So they cross the border and they are living in Pakistan and they are singing uh, the songs for, you know, freedom. Amir uh, 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 Khil and all of the singers. So they are living in Pakistan and Pakistani people supporting them. They are doing concerts and singing Afghani freedom song. So I think this is the power of art and this is the power of art, cinema and the films Then we are together and we are talking like this. So thank you so much and uh, thank you so much, sir. And th thank you so much. And I am, you know, I'm so grateful to be here today. Thank you so much. Black here. Firstly, um, I'm so happy that you both are here tonight. Um, my question is for um, Ariana Said. Um, as a teacher, I've always been the biggest advocate for education. Um, you know, education is the one of the most powerful um, uh, tool that, you know, we can change the world. And 
given the current situation in Afghanistan where women are unable to attend school and their rights are severely restricted, um, girls and women who have completed their bachelor's, their master's degree, a lot of them are shattered. Their hopes have been broken. What message do you have for these women at the moment that are currently under the Taliban restriction? What is that hope message you want to send to these uh, beautiful women? Thank you. The most important thing that I want to say to them is not to give up. Don't give up. You have to uh, continue fighting. You have to continue trying to raise your voice. Uh, people like me who are out, outside Afghanistan right now, I'm running uh, an organization and I actually meet up online with at least 20 to 30 women from inside Afghanistan. I literally see them on the camera and I speak to them. And my organization is called DEFA. And uh, this is the message I always have for them. I have to, you know, tell them to not give up. Don't give up hope. Because remember, Taliban came. This is the second round they came. The first time they came, you know, they were there in power for five years. And then what happened? They disappeared. And I'm a big believer that this time is going to be the same. This brutal rule, the problems, the issues that is going on right now is not going to stay forever. Because at the end of the day, you know, people have power over governments. They have power over uh, uh, politics. And in the end, people are going to win. But all they have to do is they have to stand up, they raise their voice, and they have to fight back. They should not stay silent. Because have a beard, but anyway, <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Kabir Khan. First of all, such an honor. Uh, I, I feel like this is a dream that my better half is sitting beside one of the most legendary oh. directors. Uh, I feel accomplished on this side right now. Oh. So thank you, thank you for having you here. Thank you. Where you are today, it's not easy. I understand, and I'm not making a comment. I have a question. Yes, With with everything you have achieved so far, uh, as a director, as a filmmaker, as somebody who has seen so much of life, at this moment, sitting here, what is your purpose for the rest of your life? Do I have an answer? <laughs> no, so, you know, the, the thing is, I'm a filmmaker, right? And there's a reason why I chose to make, a, make certain kinds of films. I was very clear when I transited from documentaries to, to films that I want to do mainstream cinema. And part of the reason is that mainstream cinema has an impact that just goes across such a large spectrum. As I said, it saved my life. Um, so even though my, my films always have a very political backdrop, which to begin with was complete taboo. I mean, Rajiv will say like, 15, 16 years ago when I started. Politics in mainstream cinema was something was you were yeah. not supposed to do. Yeah. I, was, I was very uh, fortunate and privileged that I got the backing of one of the biggest uh, studios in, uh, in Hindi cinema, Yashrat Studios, that emboldened me to keep bringing in politics into my films, even when I was dealing with superstars like Salman Khan. Um, and... And I felt that that continues to then make a bit of a difference. And for me, you know, I never really thought about uh, the level at which you've pitched, pitched the question. But for me, I, I would love to continue to tell stories, the stories that really sort of uh, hit the sweet spot for me, like make me, uh, like make me want to tell that story very, very passionately. And I feel my success is only till the time that I'm allowed to pick those stories, whether they are commercially successful or not successful. If, if I'm still allowed to choose my next story and it's not a studio head telling me, no, I think it's better you do this now, that's what my, where my success will continue. And I hope that I'm able to continue telling stories that, uh, that I feel are important, will of course will entertain and engage people, but also there's, there will be something that they'll take away. Uh, from the film, and, and, and I hope I'm able to do that, that. Till, till the end. You're a director with a purpose. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. 
Oh, there's a, yes, please. Your tone, <laughs> your tone to music for Afghan so much. You've inspired so many young Afghan girls, so we just love you so much for that. You've been oh, a thank lot you. Us. Thank you so much. Yes, Puneet has a question. Something about Hazib, like uh, Hazib, 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 yeah. Hazib. So how did he? So how did he support you? And how you know uh, Hazib's kind of personality can have a positive impact on Taliban men? Okay. <laughs> I have to agree to this point. He actually has a positive impact um, on so many men in our society. I have to tell you, because. He is probably one of the rarest men in Afghanistan who would actually dare to stand beside a woman like me, you know, who's a singer, who's bold, you know, who, you know, pursues uh, uh, the things she wants and follows her heart. And it's not easy to be a man like Hasib standing beside me, you know, because yes, uh, there may be a lot of people who admire him and love him for what he does, uh, you know, supporting a woman like me. But at the same time, there are so many people in our society that completely hate him for it, especially Taliban and mullahs and all of those people. They probably think if Hasib was not there, Ariana would not be there because he is the man behind her when she goes to Afghanistan. So I have to say I honestly love and respect him for the personality that he has for his guts, for being a proper, complete man that any woman can dream of having. So I am that lucky woman, and I appreciate him for standing beside beside me all these years. But uh, besides the you know uh, the challenges and everything, and he's still there and he still supports me, and I appreciate. And he's a lovely man. <laughs> <laughs> What a lovely note, note to end on. But thank you so much, Kabir. Thank you, Ariana. More you. power and indeed, I think art and, and music. You're right. If it, if it, even if it can't move mountains, it does. If it, if it, if it inspires us to think and to think differently and to relook at the way that we we have been conditioned to think about people and places and and and, and I suppose then that is the power of art. Thank you so much. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank Thanks you. for having thank me. You.